Good evening, everybody. Thanks for attending um, this month's Silicon Valley uh, Productivity Engineering Meetup. I want to thank Mike and Sagita for kind of inviting me. And this talk is Platforms at Twilio, Unlocking Developer Effectiveness, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Platform. This is for any of you Kubrick fans out there. My name's uh, Justin Kitagawa, and I'm a platform leader at Twilio. I'm responsible for Platform Foundation, so the five uh, platform engineering teams that span edge infrastructure and cloud orchestration at Twilio. And I'm honored in, to speak to you today about the power of platforms, how they work at Twilio, and how they're a lever that unlocks productivity for Twilio engineers. So first off, a show of hands of who's heard of Twilio? All right, cool, nearly everybody. Who's, uh, who's used Twilio? This is actually a trick question. I bet you every single one of you has actually used Twilio. You have either um, received or sent some form of communication through us. For those that have used us uh, programmatically, what does Twilio make you think of? <laughs> Notifications. <laughs> let's, go ask, let's go ask Twitter for this, right? So. I did a search for Twilio um, last month, and um, Aurora writes, just finished integrating Twilio with WordPress for a client, and I have to say, the service and API were a pleasure to work with. So simple and clean. Ryan responded, Twilio's API is fantastic. Smiley face. Miles says, Twilio's perfect. Just built an entire interactive voice response answering service, an outgoing call recorder in a day. Wow. So now if I can summarize these tweets, our customers love Twilio for our simple, easy to use communication APIs, which is fantastic because we're a cloud communication platform and we're built to fuel the future of communication. Our communication building blocks are controlled programmatically via our aforementioned simple and easy to use APIs. For example, here's some Twilio code to send a text message. In just five lines of Python, we're sending a text message that says, hello, San Francisco or initiating a voice phone call from our Java helper library. And all of this is possible with phone numbers in 100 countries worldwide, but that's not all we do. We have services like programmable video, which allow developers to create WebRTC video applications. If you want to create your own custom Hangouts, you can um, with programmable video. Or programmable wireless, which enables cellular Internet of Things connectivity. Um, a lot of you have seen like these Lime bikes or scooters that are around. They have a... Twilio wireless chip kind of embedded in them. Or Twilio Flex, our next generation cloud contact uh, center platform. And all of this is built by Twilio Engineering. We're comprised of 100, two, 100 plus two pizza engineering teams. The two pizza team is a term um, invented by Amazon and it refers to a rule that an engineering team has to be fed by two pizzas. Twilio shares the same organizational DNA as Amazon. Jeff Lawson, our CEO, was one of the first AWS product managers, and our board member, Rick Dizel, was CIO at Amazon and oversaw the development of AWS. Each of our 100 plus teams is a mini startup that owns their own backlog. And most importantly, their own microservices. Our microservices are coded in a polyglot of languages, including Java, Scala, Python, and PHP. Now, this is like advantageous and challenging at the same time. Um, uh, teams are free to kind of develop in a, in a subset of the, or in one of these languages, right? Um, and at the same time for platform, it can be challenging. Twilio has 1,000 plus server roles deployed over 10,000 VMs in nine points of presence worldwide. And all teams are aligned by a strong DevOps culture. DevOps is not a role at Twilio. It's not a job title at Twilio. It's our culture. You build it, you run it. Teams own and operate their own services. There's no centralized QA, build, or release teams. Teams test, release, and build themselves through shared platforms built by platform engineering. We believe in the DevOps model. We've observed that team ownership fosters accountability and aligns incentives. We have a saying in uh, engineering, job number one, operations and security. Job number two, everything else. If a services team's not meeting their SLAs, SLOs, or KPIs, they should be fixing their service, not building bright, shiny features. And finally, we're DevOps veterans. We've been doing this for nearly a decade, and I want to share some of our learnings. So let's go back to our team structure a bit. 
we have vertical teams and horizontal teams. Uh, voice, messaging, and video are example of vertical teams. They own a subset of our communication platform, and these teams own their services end to end. Then we have some horizontal teams. And horizontal teams provide common core services that lev vertical teams leverage. And these horizontal teams are what we call our platform teams. Platforms are a lever. We built a robust internal platform to scale our voice and messaging products, but all teams, old and new, are able to leverage it. And as a result, all of Twilio engineering is able to stand on the shoulders of giants. And in the same way that Twilio is the intersection of communication and software, simple, easy to use APIs, platform engineering at Twilio is the intersection of DevOps and software, simple, easy to use APIs. And which is why we say we are Twilio for Twilio. So I wanna share some real world numbers that uh, platform enables, 100. Uh, this is the average number of production deployments last month per weekday. So that's 100 times per day that Twilio is getting better, faster, stronger, safer. Right now, um, including kind of like weekend deployments, we're on track for 30,000 production deployments per year. Two, this is the number of days that a customer has to wait before a new feature is surfaced to them. So I think those are pretty like um, awesome numbers, right? But it hasn't always been this way. And it hasn't always been sunshine and rainbows. Four years ago, we had an imperative infrastructure as code as our platform. Engineers were required to be intimately aware of Chef to get um, services shipped. We had a DSL that sh uh, was checked into Git to help administer deployments. We had a consultative platform. Platform uh, engineers acted as consultants to help engineers onboard to various platform services. And while all this might sound great, it wasn't that good. Four years ago, imagine a company that couldn't ship reliably. Core platform services were falling over. When I joined in Q4 of 2014, a core deployment service was falling over. We had experienced 264,500, so those are server errors, over the quarter. That's like a 2.9 success rate. For a company that aspires for a 5.9 success rate, this wasn't cutting it. But aside from aspirational goals, this had a very real world problem of preventing teams from deploying their software. It was viewed as really kind of almost an existential threat to Twilio. The company that ships software couldn't ship. It was an era of gatekeepers. In the name of protecting the platform or saving engineers from themselves, platforms acted as a gatekeeper. The dreaded I request, a JIRA ticket that was routed for manual execution to a platform engineer, block critical tasks and functions. Platforms was viewed company-wide as a roadblock. It was an era marked by a lack of empathy. Platform teams didn't even use the tooling that they were building for the rest of the company. This is actually a surprising anti-pattern that I see repeated over and over at various organizations. Incentives aren't alive properly when teams building their platforms aren't using them themselves. And it was an era of vendor sprawl. Teams were intimately aware of all vendors and tooling. I'll posit a question to you. If every team needs to have a Jenkins expert or an admin on it, is the platform really helping your users or are you distributing platforms responsibilities to the rest of the org? In short, our platform was broken. But then three years ago, we had a philosophical shift. Moving forward, our platform development was to be API first, a platform that valued self-service over gatekeepers and was opinionated to be a declarative platform over an imperative one. And finally, it was a platform to be built with empathy. So I'm gonna dive into each of these principles into a little bit more detail. API first. Twilio is an API company. Here's Jeff at like kind of like the stock exchange waving an API flag. API is the platform's control plane. The API comes before the UI. The API comes before the CLI. Git or SEM are not our control plane. We use Git. It triggers, it triggers things, but it's not our control plane. A REST or web-based API is. Who here has ever had to like refactor a portion of like their platform? Right. So refactoring platforms is contingent on strong interfaces. If there isn't an interface, trust me, your engineers will find an interface and it'll be one that you cannot control. An example, four years ago, our service discovery system 
had five points of entry that our engineers hacked. The main reason, we didn't have a published interface. And if you don't publish an interface, an engineer will find one. API first forces platforms teams to define their interfaces up front. In my experience, David Wheeler's famous saying, all problems in computer science can be solved by a level of indirection holds true. As much as possible, we do not want our engineers coding directly to vendor APIs. We have an API in front that we control in the form of a remote API gateway or a local host sidecar with APIs on VM instances. We have a level of indirection to our third-party vendors and tooling. This facilitates easier future migration and mitigates lock-in. Putting this into a service also allows us to apply consistent, consistent monitoring around these integrations. I mentioned sidecar services previously, and the re one of the reasons we do this is because we have a polyglot. We have multiple languages that we have to code to. So even if we wanted to kind of code a library, well, then that means that now we're coding into five different libraries and such, right? So instead, what we do is we have a sidecar. So this is effectively like a daemon that will sit on like a VM. And they have APIs on them as well. So by removing uh, platform service from libraries and into sidecars, we can easily upgrade the sidecar without requiring teams to rebuild their applications. It's also available to all languages immediately. Any libraries that we do have are just really thin wrappers that are effectively only curling um, like the, the, the sidecar. And API First also allows us to maintain consistency and control the rollout of our control plane. Users get working softwares as we, roll, as we roll it out. Users aren't forced to get pull, download new binaries to get upgrades or bug fixes. And finally, REST APIs have a comprehensive set of error codes to leverage. Rich validation should never be an afterthought. HTTP body payloads can give you rich, meaningful error message to inform your user of errors. This, I believe, is our most important principle. A platform must be self-service. We're a DevOps shop and teams need to be able to control their destiny. In a 2011 letter to shareholders, Jeff Bezos wrote, I'm emphasizing the self-service nature of these platforms because I think it's important for a reason that I think is somewhat non-obvious. Even well-meaning gatekeepers slow innovation. When a platform is self-service, even improbable ideas can get tried because there's no expert gatekeeper ready to say, that will never work. And guess what? Many of those improbable ideas do work and society is the beneficiary of that diversity. Flow is so important to engineering and to engineers. It's vital not to block the flow of your engineers. Anytime they need to ask or are not free to execute themselves, you've interrupted their flow. You've introduced a context switch. Get out of the way. Naturally, automation comes up when thinking about enabling self-service. I urge you to not fall into the automated fallacy though, that because it's scripted, it's automated. If it can only be executed by somebody's laptop or on a special Jenkins server by a certain member of a certain team with certain permissions, it's not automated in my book because it's not self-service. Declarative over imperative or the what over the how. Our platform prefers users to declaratively specify what they want to achieve over how they imperatively are going to achieve it. This can also be thought of as data models over code. We prefer users to represent their desired state of the world in terms of data and models over imperative code. The how is codified into our platform. This removes burden from our users. They don't need to know all the steps to get from point A to point B. They just need to know that they want to get to point B. We're in San Francisco. Probably unlikely that on a Wednesday night you're going to hear a reference to Donald Rumsfeld, but here goes. <laughs> there are known unknowns, that is to say there are things we know that we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns. There are things that we don't know we don't know. Users often don't know all the steps and best practices to reach their goals. They're often naive how to implement new use cases. They have unknown unknowns they aren't cognizant of. By embedding the how into the platform, they benefit from best practices that they weren't aware of. And if the platform has saved the declarative state of the world versus the imperative logic of how to achieve that state, best practices can evolve. Paths can be optimized. Betterments distributed automatically because they're embedded in the platform. Now, it's interesting that 
this approach towards declarative APIs evolved at the same time in both the communication platform at Twilio and then also internally with our um, engineering platform. When we began introducing declarative APIs and concepts within the engineering platform, we were doing the same with our communication platform, shipping Twilio, Notify, and Proxy. Proxy takes a common use case, anonymizing communication with a proxy phone number, and simplifies its development with a declarative API. So this use case is what like Lyft and Uber will use. When you receive a text message or a phone call from a driver, you're really not getting um, a phone call from that person's phone number, the driver's phone number, or the rider's phone number. You're receiving it from a proxy phone number. And so this is kind of like that use case. So just in three lines of Ruby, we've implemented this use case that prior to this took teams, a whole team kind of um, multiple uh, months to kind of like develop, right? Once again, simple, easy to use APIs. And so now I want to describe how declarative models and APIs work in three areas of our platform, API development, deployments, and our service mesh. The Twilio API. All REST APIs come through a service called Starship. Starship is an edge federated API gateway that routes, transforms, and filters API requests. It's responsible for handling authentication, account authorization, and concurrency limits. Back to our diagram um, previously, right? So the vertical teams kind of own and operate the services and the API sits in front. And there's Starship. So as a request comes in, um, this is an API request into Twilio, uh, Starship will transform the, the, the team's request for the downstream API. So for example, we can take HTTP in, um, input parameters and turn it into a JSON payload that we send downstream. The downstream will return with their responses and then the Starship will then transform and format the response into JSON or XML. So every team doesn't need to know and how to trans, um, format all the things. And then we also add pagination so that we have consistent pagination for um, all of um, our APIs. And this is how we get a consistent look and feel to the APIs. And so like for instance, if the next request comes in and it's supposed to go to messaging, it can go and get routed to messaging. Now in the past, API team was a consulting team. Anytime a new API needed to be surfaced, the API team would be surfacing, uh, would work on a statement of work. And then we'd identify kind of what, how the API was going to be. And then the API team would then work on a consultant engagement to add API proxy code to Starship. Our cycle time or the amount of time it took from um, idea to getting out in production was in the order of weeks to months. The lead up to Signal, our developer confidence was horrid, not only for the API team, but for any team that wanted to surface their API. Teams would, in an effort to try to help, would submit PRs to Starship, which would inevitably have to get rewritten. And then both uh, the API team would be angered that somebody's like trying to touch their code. And then the team is like angry that like uh, uh, that the work that they did is kind of like wasted. But we move to a declarative API model and API definitions. So an API definition is a declarative representation of the Twilio API. So every resource in the Twilio REST API has an API definition. So for this instance, let's dive down into our call API definition. API definition has metadata for the API resource, such as domain, version, and relative paths to the resources list and instance endpoints. There's enumerations for the enums on that resource properties for that particular resource. If you're familiar with our calls API, some of these properties may look familiar to you. And finally, we have metadata for actions available onto that resource. So now that we have these API definitions, now what? Well, we can do some really interesting things for our developers now. With API definitions, we enable self-service. Teams are now able to deploy Starship in a self-service manner. They just kind of work with their API definitions and that kicks off um, a pipeline that goes and deploys uh, updated code that will load those API definitions and compile them into uh, the proxy code. So now teams are effectively unblocked and we don't have gatekeepers that are enable that uh, the API team is blocking API deployments. There's improved security. Because we have a schema, if you will, for all of our API, um, we have a strict contract of what the API should be. So teams will often have internal APIs intermingled with their customer APIs or properties on resources that are for internal use only. Because we have a schema, we're able to filter all that out and so we're protecting kind of uh, developers from themselves. And it prevents kind of unwanted data leaks. And refactoring is an inevitability. 
refactoring or resactoring, as some of my colleagues like to call a major refactoring, always occurs. And if you've ever had to refactor an entire system while maintaining 0% downtime, you can feel something like this. Um, trying to like change the tires on a car while it's still m m moving, right? Every request at Twilio is precious. We review success rates weekly at our weekly ops meetings. HTTP 500s or server-side failures are scrutinized. We strive for a 5-9 success rate. That's like one error in every 100,000 requests. Now, how do we enable this and make sure that we can have safe um, uh, API deployments? Well, we have request shadowing. And all of the uh, request shadowing is available in um, API definitions. What shadowing does is it enables teams to deploy both their old and new services concurrently in production. And we're able to assert expected behaviors on the new service and detect any changes um, before rolling it out completely. So what will happen here is as a request comes in, we copy the request and send it to both voice one and voice V2, right? And then we'll come back and then we'll take a diff on the responses and then we'll record the diff. And so then we can kind of let the downstream team know, hey, your service now is, has 100% fidelity with like kind of like the old API. And all of this is available with API definitions. They put a flag on this and teams can kind of get this functionality for free. Once they've kind of viewed that like it's ready to go out into production, then we can, um, we want to, more than often than not, if we're doing a, a big uh, migration, we want to roll this out incrementally. And so what we have the ability to do is use switch. And with switch, we can put account flags. So for our, um, uh, let's say for instance, our high value customers, we won't roll them out till kind of like the end. And we can kind of just control the rollout of this. And so the way that works is that when customer A comes in, if they have the switch turned on, they'll go to the old service. Or customer B comes in, they'll go to the new one. So we're able to kind of control this. And once again, this is all done through API definitions. We toggle through API definitions. But that's not it. We also suffered from helper library drift in the past. So whenever we have a new API at Twilio, we also have to surface this in what we call our helper libraries. Um, and they're available in six different languages. Java, C Sharp, PHP, Ruby, Python, and Node. Prior to um, four years ago, three years ago, all of these libraries were kind of handcrafted, artisanally manicured and uh, maintained SDKs, if you will. And the problem is that as new APIs came out, sometimes we wouldn't get like that um, new API in a particular um, implementation of the SDK. And what happened is that they evolved over time too. And since they're handcrafted, sometimes different parts of even the same API SDK started to look and feel differently because different people owned and operated, right? They became out of sync. It wasn't a great customer experience. So what happened? We take our a API definitions and then we started to auto-generate our libraries with a, with a project called yo, -Yo Dime. So yo, yo Dime is a transpiler. And so it takes our API definitions. So in this case, let's go back to calls and look at our enums. And then if you kind of look, and this is the source code for our um, a Java transpile library, you can see the enums, how they get kind of projected into the, into the end class. And here is how it's kind of projected onto Python. Now these are the enums, but I just did this so that you can kind of get a, a, a mental picture of how this works. Now, right now, we have the ability that once a week, we, dep we um, uh, transpile and like publish our libraries so that our libraries are always in sync with kind of like what is deployed with our API. At Signal last year, which is our developer conference, it was the first time that every API that was announced in the keynote was available in our SDKs by the end of the keynote. And this is all possible because of declarative API definitions. But that's not it. We also have auto-generated documentation. Twilio is GDPR compliant. Um, not sure, is anyone familiar with GDPR? We've heard of this, right? General data privacy regulations. Um, most comprehensive laws to ensure customers in control of their data. It's a great piece of legislation coming out of Europe. Twilio treats this kind of very seriously. And in fact, we are one of 130 companies worldwide that has achieved binding, cor our, our EU has approved our binding corporate rules governing data privacy. Well, in our documentation for our APIs, you can actually see how long the PII, the data is kind of, um, that will hold and maintain the data that, that we have, right? All of this is specified in the API definitions because we just have this declarative things and then we project onto the world. 
All right, so now let's move from API development into deployments. Now, if you're in platforms and you, let's say you're resource constrained, because we're all a resource constrained. If you can focus on one thing, and like, well, I feel like it's appropriate, we're here at Circle CI, right? Focus on deployments. Um, deployments is the biggest bang for your buck. It's the thing that you want and ideally want to be having and forcing a culture that you're deploying frequently and often and reducing cycle time. This is the biggest bang for your buck. So 35,000 deployments uh, or 30,000 deployments for you, it doesn't matter if you're triggering an incident on every deployment, right? So you need to make sure that this is safe and reliable. So the way Twilio does deployments is we have uh, what, uh, disposable infrastructure. So we don't use long-lived VMs. We're in AWS, but we don't use long-lived VMs. We don't replace code on our servers. We replace them with new servers every time. And we require zero downtime deployments. So we use a technique, which is also, um, we use the terminology from Netflix red block deployments, right? But if we're going to replace um, a given service, we're really only replacing one level of the tier at a time. And so let's say, for instance, in our application, we're at version three, and we want to move to version four. We'll spin up new boxes with version four, then bring one of those boxes into Canary and slowly start to kind of like put traffic over onto four. If that looks like it works out okay, we will then swap over and cut our load balancer over to number four, and we'll leave number three as a fallback. In the event that an incident occurs and something happens and that deployment's not good, we can always fall back. And with the, um, all, this, all of this implement, um, uh, orchestration is kind of part of the orchestration team at Twilio. But in the past, we had solely imperative deployments using um, imperative API constructs like booting a host or hosts or taking a host in and out of load balancer. Now, while those are powerful building blocks, they didn't reduce the cognitive load for engineers. Our attempt at infrastructure code resulted in a confusing DSL. Teams, including the orchestration team, had difficulty determining how many hosts were supposed to be in any given environment because the DSL actually had to be executed to get the, the right number. And because it's a Turing complete language, yeah, sometimes it was easy and you could prioritize it out, but then other times it's like obfuscated. And all the, and because of, it was in this Turing complete DSL. Also the DSL was in, um, was using Git as a control plane. So you check into, into Git and then like um, another service would kind of like pull that Git repo. And this created confusion because there wasn't a really a uh, um, knowledge of when your changes would actually go out. It'd be kind of at the discretion and be having it somewhat asynchronously and there wouldn't be a way to check on it at all, right? But then we pivoted to a declarative deployment model. So what's in a deployment for a Twilio? Well, in a deployment, we have software, hardware, and configuration. Software is represented as a manifest, and in, it is a representation of all the artifacts that we're deploying onto um, for a given deployment. So for VMs, we use RPMs, and we use uh, like kind of CentOS variant, right? And so we specify the RPMs and the particular versions. The hardware infrastructure formation sorry, it, 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 hardware infrastructure specification is a formation. And this is, for example, I want to have 40 nodes of X amount of RAM or of this instant type, right? So it's just kind of like the infrastructure or hardware specification. And then configuration is this ex externalized configuration. So think Heroku's 12-factor apps. So if you have some sort of environment variable that changes within a given environment or um, within a given um, data center, that should be externalized into a different realm. You don't want to have like case statements like if pro do this or if stage do that. Now a manifest is promoted through the environments while a formation and configuration can be different through environments. And all of these are available as APIs and available in our platform console, Admiral. And so here is just a, a kind of a, a demonstration of kind of like what Admiral looks like. And so teams will go in and then they can specify, in this case, we're going to specify the formation. So we specify the different packages that we have and like the versions of those different packages. And then we will cut over to our infrastructure and then we can kind of specify how many hosts we want to have and deploy to. And then the deployment occurs. And now you can see here, these are all the steps that are actually being taken. And we have a convergence engine that is actually looking out in the world and making sure that we can bring and, br and bridge the, um, the declarative administrative state of the world with the operational state of what is actually occurring, right? 
but our team members don't need to think about this. They're just able to kind of just specify what their intent is and let it up to the, the platform to do this. And this will automatically, for instance, spread the um, VMs across three um, availability zones, right, to make sure that we're in kind of in high availability and such. So what else? We're enabling right now containers at, at Twilio. And so we plan to use Kubernetes as our uh, container orchestration system, but we don't want our engineers to know about Kubernetes or its syntax. The bulk of our engineers don't care. They just want to deploy their code. They want to potentially use containers and have a, a good, neat, like a uh, um, clean local developer environment, right? But they absolutely do need to know all of kind of like the intricacies of Kubernetes. And if they do have to know that, we feel that it's almost a kind of a failure state for us. We know it's going to be a gradual migration. We know that we're going to be heterogeneous for as long as probably Twilio exists. We're going to be VMs and containers and functions kind of all commingling together and working together. And so we're already seeing kind of like the benefits of like this declarative model right now. So teams seeking to adopt containers don't have to adjust their mental model for deployments. Instead of a collection of versioned RPM objects, they spe specify a collection of versioned container manifests, which is really versioned container images. And then the platform eventually transposes these when we get to Kubernetes into a Kubernetes pod, or right now we'll just spin it up onto um, an existing VM as just co-located Docker images on a VM. But it's abstracted away from our users and they don't have to know about it. And I intimated at this. So right now we have our deployments are kind of going to uh, just VMs right now for our containers, right? And teams are beginning to use and leverage containers. They don't need to wait for kind of like this, the panacea of like a full-fledged kind of container uh, Kubernetes orchestrated bin packed system and such, right? We're able to get value right now in their local developer experience and start to cross this mental model. And then once we get our Kubernetes um, container system, all that will be necessary is they'll just specify a new formation. And then they'll just be, do their deployments like that. And teams are really excited that like they don't have to kind of like learn a different mental model. They can just kind of take what they're kind of doing right now and just with a very simple shift, go to this new, um, this new model. And I guess the final piece that I want to talk about is uh, MySQL deployments. So Twilio is a big fan of MySQL. And why? Because it works. Uh, we know it's failure scenarios. MySQL, Cassandra are like our two trusted data stores for, for databases, at least for like, I guess what you consider database data stores. We have other caching things, right? But, so in our system, like all of our data clusters, database clusters look something like this. We have a primary, we have replicas, we have analytics, a backup, and monitor. So primaries replicate to the replicas, analytics, and backups. All writes go to the primary. Schema migra migrations are always executed on the replica. And when we execute a pivot, we take uh, a backup and upload it to S3. The replicas were promoted. And then we have software that sets up an SSH tunnel to forward outstanding write requests from the primary to the promoted replica. It's complicated. It's like a lot of kind of moving parts in here, right? And the challenge was prior to us um, doing MySQL deployments, this was a semi-manual process. Teams would effectively have whole engineers just dedicated to kind of like making sure that this kind of like pivot goes up. Um, and once again, we have scripts, but they're executed by a human. They're going out, right? And remember what I said about scripts. And so now this is kind of like what the flow looks like in um, um, currently right now. And in this, we specify, uh, in this case, our, um, the notion of a manifest is actually what schema, if you do have a schema migration, that is actually wrapped up in the schema in, in that. So like if you want to kind of like bump to like a new schema migration, this will go and execute and make sure that that, uh, that occurs, right? And then in the formation, you specify like the overall topology of like what you want your MySQL things. And once again, all of the details are kind of like hidden from our users. When we, do, when we release this, um, we have in Admiral, we have some in-product placement, um, ad placement here. And uh, the response was... Um, this was actual uh, like um, some of the response that came in Slack, right? And OMG, is that true? I'm going to cry. <laughs> we'll try it on Friday. <laughs> and ha ha, what, what, what do you want to do it around? So like, it really does kind of, when you kind of help your users and make them be able to do something that previously was causing them so much pain, you'll see like in, in, intense joy. We got hugs in the hallway. <laughs> one, one engineer kind of came up to an engineer manager was like, oh, 
I want to hug you. And he's like, I don't think it's appropriate. He's like, oh, screw it. I'm going to hug you anyways. <laughs> and he ended up hugging him. So. All right. And then a service mesh. So I talked about kind of our red-black deployments at Twilio, right? And so one of the challenges that occurs with this is that there are no static IPs to connect with when we go downstream. So they're always changing. So this leads to our need for service discovery. Important thing to know with our service discovery is we don't use and rely on DNS at Twilio. Um, Amazon's DNS is kind of like notoriously flaky, so we just don't use it. Uh, we use private IPs and our VPC, and uh, as, as such, we just kind of take the IPs that are assigned to particular VMs, and then we use um, our service discovery to look up what we need to contact and who we need to contact. Now, when a service, so it, in this case, let's say service A wants to talk to service B, and in this case, this is really simplified. It's just like a one-to-one, -one, but think of it more as like an end-to-end. -end. So you would have N node A's and N node B's having to talk, speak with each other, right? But, um, when service A wants to talk to something, it doesn't talk directly to service B. It talks to uh, a sidecar um, uh, on, on the box, in this case, HA proxy. And so service A talks to HA proxy, which talks HTTP 1.1 1, 1 .1 over to um, the, the downstream service. And so we have kind of effectively a distributed load balancer. And this is like uh, our service mesh. And the sidecar responds to... Uh, push notification on a web socket of service discovery events. And if there's any update to the downstream, we reconfigure HA proxy and hub the process. This is a little bit, um, uh, it, it, that is to simplify because really there's also Nginx that kind of sits in front. So this is kind of still kind of simplified, but we have Nginx in front that takes it and then HA proxy that goes and like makes the actual request. This is a configuration beast. Even though it's super reliable, and this is like
Yeah, this is more, this is more aspirational. So like, uh, are, we have a pro, uh, so Twilio has a function. So we have a serverless, um, um, which is, uh, that is a public offering that's for our end customers. And right now internally, we use Lambda. The goal here is to make sure that when people are developing that they're the internal, and right now it's kind of off the beaten path, if you will. And so the goal is to be able to um, facilitate VMs, containers, and functions, and let, based on their use case, engineers be able to choose what is right for them. And so we're kind of in stream with these two, and then like functions is kind of like next. So it's divorced from our public offering right now. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to, I'm going to stick around and I'm happy to talk more after. Thank you. Thank you.